Thanks so much for joining us today. Our hope and prayer is that God will use this message powerfully in your life and that it'll bring you closer to him. If you'd like more information about our church or if you'd like to hear more messages, you can visit vibechurch.com or download our app. Now get ready to receive a word from the Lord. Hey, we, we've been in a series called A New Way to Be Human and uh, just discovering how to live this life that God's called us to live and, and how, what he's drawn us into. And as a, as a verse, the, kind of the foundation verse we've been looking at is in 2 Corinthians 5.17. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, that person is a new creation. The old is gone and the new is here. Now, when you read that passage of Scripture, it just sounds like it's just instantaneous, magical. It just happens, right? Uh, and there is something that just happens instantly. There is a rebirth that takes place. We go from being dead spiritually, which that's how we're born. We're born spiritually dead. We're born separated from God. We're not in relationship with Him. And we're, we're, you know, it's hard to believe, right? Because, like, look at that little baby, you know? Ezra is so cute, precious. You think, how can this baby not know Jesus? They're just precious. You know, the older we get, the meaner we get, right? And maybe you know, they have to know Jesus when they're little. But the reality is we're all born with a sinful nature. I'll guarantee you that Monica and Doug will not have to teach Ezra how to do something wrong. They're going to have to constantly say, don't do that. Stop that. Right? There's just that natural. So, so there is something that happens Immediately, and that is we become spiritually alive when we give our hearts to Christ, when we confess Him, and, and that happens instantaneously. That's not something we have to work towards. And that is, that is us submitting ourselves to Christ, and we're stepping like I illustrated on Easter Sunday. We're, we're in Christ. We step into Christ. We lose our identity. Let me say it again. We lose our identity. The problem with a lot of people is that they want to maintain their identity, but then they want to slap Jesus stickers on themselves. That's not how it works. I'm sorry. That's what causes us problems. That's why most of the world, or a good bit of the world, has a problem with the church. But when we lose ourselves in Him, when we're in Christ, we're new creations. There's a transformation that takes place inside. The old is gone, the new has come. Now, here's the, here's the struggle, okay? Because the struggle is real. Here's the struggle, is that that change doesn't always show up instantaneously, does it? Boy, I wish it did. So if the old is gone, the new has come, then why is it that we struggle with things? Why, is, why can't I change immediately, right? Mark Twain said this. He said, the only thing, the only one, excuse me, that likes change is a wet baby, we don't like change. We don't like change. I don't know. When I came into a relationship with Jesus, I had layers. I had issues. I had stuff. Did anybody else, anybody else come into a relationship with Jesus with stuff? You know, and we, we, we had layer after layer. And, and uh, nobody knew we had layers till they got to know us. Right? But man, I, I wish I only had three layers when I came into a relationship with you. We all have layers. You may have grown up in church. You may have grown up in a great Christian family. But it doesn't mean you're saved. You don't come out of the womb saved, right? Hello, it doesn't happen. You have layers. You have that sinful nature. When I'm, you know, I was only 16 years old. You think, how bad can a 16-year-old be? Well, I've already shared some of my sins. Not all of them. You won't hear about all of them. But I had, I had layers. I had fear. I had doubts. I had insecurity. Unforgiveness. Addiction. Lust. I, mean, I, had, I had layers in my life. And that didn't change immediately. I remember the moment that I gave my heart to Jesus. I remember that. I'll never forget it. Very powerful experience for me emotionally. But when I 
left that building that night, I still struggled with things. You know what I'm talking about, right? We all do. We still, we still struggle. It doesn't show up. That, that 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that, that, that thing that happens isn't immediately showing up on the outside. It happens on the inside. There is a new birth. The Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us, and we'll talk about that more in just a second. But there's a process that happens. And so what happened when, when, I, when I first started following Jesus and I watched other people and I saw how they lived and, and I listened to them, I wanted, I wanted that. And so I figured I would help the Lord. So I started cleaning up my act, right? I started doing some of them, some of the things obviously I needed to, you know, but, but I just started cleaning up my act. And I was, I was, I was doing all, I quit hanging out with all my old friends. I mean, they, I went a wall on them. They were like, what happened to you? Later, come, come to find out, they thought I joined some cult or something because I just totally went off the grid. I was just, they were gone. I quit listening to all my music. I almost broke up with Robin. I learned a whole new lingo that we have at church. I went to church every time the doors were open. All of that was an attempt to change. Now, none, none of that is necessarily bad, although I think dissing my friends and not telling them about Jesus was not a good thing. But it was an attempt for me to change. It was an attempt for me to, to have what's happened on the inside match up with the outside. And so what happens, though, is that when we change ourselves, all we do is change what people see. And, and this, this is where religious people are born. This is where religion happens. When we focus on cleaning up the outside, so much so to match the inside, that we're the ones cleaning ourselves up. And when we don't see it in other people, we get frustrated with them. And we want to help them, right? Right? Like, you need to stop doing that. You, need to, you know, we, we want to help the Holy Spirit out. Now, some of you are like, What's, where's he going with this, right? Our goal is to reflect the image of God, not to impersonate it. You know what really, what really was important or what really uh, mattered in the process in, in my life and, and what really mattered is when my mom finally saw the change. Because at first she thought, you joined some cult. I grew up Catholic. You know, all of a sudden, and all this stuff's going on, and we had some friction, and we had, you know, we went, I went through, I, I struggled with stuff trying to figure out this new life and what it's supposed to look like. But when my mom finally saw the transformation, it was like, okay, I get it. I discovered something that, that, I really couldn't change myself, but God could transform me. And there's a big difference. See, because change is something we attempt, but transformation is something that the Holy Spirit brings about in our lives. And so there's this tension that we have to learn to live in. If anyone is in Christ, if you submitted yourself to Christ the Holy Spirit has come to live inside of you. There is a spiritual transformation that, that immediately, immediately. But it takes time to show up on the outside. Not everything. Not everything does. I, I quit cussing, I, and that was a, it was a second language for me. I, I'm not kidding. I quit cussing like that. I mean, when I knew I was really saved is when I hit my finger with a hammer and it wasn't a curse word that came out. I was like, whoa, thank you, Jesus. I mean, man, this is real. There's some things, yeah, you, you, it's going to stop right away. Some things, for the sake of, of your survival, you better stop right away. But the Holy Spirit is one that transforms us. He's the one that transforms us. And there's this tension that we have to learn to live in. And we have to allow the Holy Spirit 
to work in our lives. And we have to allow the Holy Spirit to work in other people's lives. Acts chapter 15, and we're not gonna, I'm not going to preach out of a passage there, but I just want to tell you what's going on in Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15, Paul goes back to Jerusalem for the, Jeru- the, the council at Jerusalem. It's in A.D. 49, took place. This council of Jerusalem was a meeting of the apostles and disciples, probably, well, the whole church. They met together in, in Jerusalem to discuss an issue that the church, the early church, the first century church, I mean, remember the church is very young at this, at this point, very young, probably 10 to 15 years old maybe. And the, and the challenge that the early church was facing was that there were people who were getting saved who were uh, Gentiles, they were non-Jewish people, they were pagans, they, they didn't have any reference of the Old Testament, they hadn't, didn't understand the law, they didn't understand any of that, they were unchurched people. They were getting saved, they were experiencing the Holy Spirit, they were, they were being filled with the Holy Spirit, I mean, there was, they were seriously being saved, they were joining the church, the church was growing And then there were also, at the same time, people who were Jewish being saved. Not just Jewish, but many Pharisees who were like a serious religious uh, leadership group. They were being saved. And they're coming into a relationship with Jesus. And you have the Gentiles, and you have the Pharisees who were steeped in the law. Coming together and worshiping together and doing life together. Because church isn't a place you go to, right? It's a place you belong. And so now they're in community together. And all of a sudden, they're hearing words, language. They're hearing things that they're doing, the Jewish, the, the Jewish people are. And, you know, and they're saying, whoa, hey, wait a second. Wait. What happened inside isn't showing up on the outside. Now, for the Jews, it was a little easier because they were already clean on the outside, but they were dirty and dead on the inside. So they had their act together on the outside. But these Gentiles, they didn't have their act together on the outside or the inside. And so all of a sudden, they experienced this new life, this new birth, but it wasn't showing up yet, right? You see the struggle? And so there was a tension because... They didn't talk the same way as the Jewish believers did. They didn't do the same things as the Jewish believers. And their struggles maybe were a little bit different culturally than our struggles, but the same thing happens today, doesn't it? When someone comes into the church, when someone comes into a relationship with Jesus and they're brand new and they've never been to church before, they don't, they don't know the Bible. They don't know how to act. They don't know how to... All this, and so there can, be, there can be a tension sometimes that we have to learn how to manage and we have to allow the Holy Spirit to do His thing. So in Acts chapter 15, what we see is Paul goes back to Jerusalem. The church is meeting together to discuss the issue of Gentiles being saved and the Jewish believers obviously being saved and the struggle that was going on in church. And so the, the, the Jewish believers, the Pharisees who were being saved, says they need to observe the law. If they're really going to be saved, if you're really going to be a Christian, you need to observe the law. You need to go back and observe the law. And so they wrestled with this. They wrestled with it. And the conclusion was, James, who was the leader in the church in Jerusalem, says, we believe it's important that we don't make it difficult for Gentiles to follow Jesus. We don't strap them with the law. Okay, so there's a struggle, this tension. And the same tension resides in every church. The same tension resides in every heart and every life. Are we going to allow the Holy Spirit to transform us? See, because here's my experience. When I changed myself, I just became religious. I had a tendency, the more I changed myself, 
I looked at people a little differently. I looked at people like, what, what's your problem? You need to get with the program. And there was this tension. But as I allowed the Holy Spirit to transform me, and I realized, you know what? The Holy Spirit will transform them also. Now, some of you are like, but, 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 can we help? But what about those people that keep doing? We'll, we'll talk about that in just a second. But we have to allow the Holy Spirit to work in people's lives. And this was what the early church experienced. Is that the leaders in the early church said this. They said, we're going to let the Holy Spirit do his thing. We're going to allow the Holy Spirit to clean people up. Because he does a great job. Right? He does a great job. So at this same time, just actually just prior to the Council of Jerusalem, Paul writes a letter to the Galatian church. And this happens. This is what he says. Because there are a group of people in the, in the church in Galatia who are teaching you need to observe the law. You, you need to help, you know, you, you need to clean yourself up, clean it, start acting right, start acting right. Listen, there's nothing wrong with acting right, but they're trying to force it and push it and, and help the Holy Spirit. And so Paul addresses the church in Galatians. He says, so, so I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Three things really quick I want to just pull out of this passage of Scripture, and then I'm going to look at some more Scriptures. Three things. One is, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Here's the tension that we have to learn to to navigate and live in, okay? Because we're never going to find that perfect place. John chapter 1 records, John explaining Jesus to, uh, to his audience, to the group that he's writing to. And he's describing Jesus as the Word of God, okay? And he says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We beheld His glory, this is King James, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And sometimes when we read that passage, we breeze right through that, and we're focusing on other things. But what we have to understand is Jesus came full of grace and truth. If you look at those two things, they are polar opposites. Because grace says everyone's welcome. No perfect people here. But truth is very exclusive. Truth is very narrow. There's a right and there's a wrong. Like we were singing this morning... It's the holiness of God. It's that He's perfect. He's unapproachable. You, you, you and I, we have, we have no right. We have no, we, there's no way we can enter His presence on our own. And so there's Jesus full of grace. Everyone's welcome, but truth. I think you see a great picture of this when, when the, the uh, uh, religious leaders, different people, whatever, whoever it was that brought the, the woman to Jesus who was caught in the act of adultery. They brought her and threw her down and, you know, you know stone her, stone her, kill her. The, the law says this, the law says this. And Jesus starts writing in the sand and we don't know what he was writing. Maybe the names of their, his, all the other guys' girlfriends and all that mistresses and and so they started leaving. It's like, I'm out of here. Jay, he's got my number. And so whatever, whatever it was, uh, that's grace. It's grace. And he looks at the woman and he says, where are your accusers? Where'd they go? 
He's like, the, 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 she says, they left. They're, they're gone. He said, well, I don't accuse you either. I'm not holding it. And, and we could stop there and just say, isn't that great? But Jesus says these words that are so important. He says, go and sin no more. So it's, it's this tension that we have to learn to navigate and live in. As individuals, if we're going to, to be what God created us to be, if, if we're going to allow the Holy Spirit to transform us and allow the Holy Spirit to transform the people around us, we have to learn how to manage that tension of grace and truth. We have a tendency, though, to, to gravitate to one or the other. When we're getting impatient with people and, and they got so many layers and we're like, hey, let me help you with that layer. You know, I want to help you take that thing off. And we get, we get to helping people. We want to clean them up on the outside. Maybe good intentions. Like, hey, this isn't healthy for you. Most likely it's good intentions. But we have to allow the Holy Spirit to transform them and us, right? Right? Because if we're just cleaning up the outside, then we're just, we're just religious, that's all. What's going on on the inside? So there's that tension of grace and truth. Of embracing everybody. and say all are welcome. But we have to also embrace truth. This is the challenge for a lot. Every church has that challenge. Some do a great job at it. Some not so good. Maybe you've experienced both ends of the spectrum. Whereas a church for church people, if you talk like us, walk like us, believe like us, if you do everything like us, then you can belong to us, right? Or maybe you've experienced a liberal church, and I don't mean liberal in the sense of like we talk about, but just liberal in, in the, hey, just anything goes, Right? Just do your thing. God will just lather you up with grace. Just do your thing. And maybe you've experienced that kind of church. Neither of them are healthy. Neither of them are right. But it's a church that manages the tension between grace and truth. There's one thing that we've never done, and I've, I've had pressure from different People that have been on our, our leadership team and said, like, we need to make a policy manual. We need to put some rules down and we need to have rules about how people dress on the worship team. We need to have rules about this and that and rules about, and, and I've fought it. I've fought it because I don't believe that, that we just make a bunch of rules for people. Some of you are like, no, I like rules. I know who you are. <laughs> I like rules. Make the rules because I can follow the rules. The reason I fought against it so much is because you're not dealing with someone's heart when you make a rule. You need to have a conversation. You need to talk with them, help them to understand. Hey, here's, here's what God wants to do in your life, and here's what he will do. You know, can we pray together? Can we, but I'm going to be patient with you. I'm not going to force you, you know. But this is what God wants to do in your life. When you have those conversations then the Holy Spirit is able to take those words and take that relationship and do something powerful. When you, when you help bring people along in a small group and you show them the Word of God and you see how it works in our life and what God wants to do and let the Holy Spirit activate that, something powerful happens. There's a transformation that takes place. It's not just cleaning up on the outside, because if you do that, you're always going to have to keep cleaning up on the outside. But when you're transformed, something, it's changed. You're, you're never going to be the same. And so we have to learn as individuals to manage that tension. We have to learn as a church to manage that tension. And so Paul says, walk by the Spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Our relationship with the Holy Spirit is key. When you and I gave our hearts to Jesus, when you confessed Christ and you said, come into my life, you're inviting the Holy Spirit to come into your life. 
Now, I know sometimes I've been in conversations with people and they question, well, well I don't think they really got saved because they still cuss. I don't think he's really saved because he smokes. I don't think he really, he's, or she's really saved. But we, we come up with this, like, now all of a sudden, we're, we're the ones determining, you know, what's going on inside. And we, we get into, into, into dangerous waters, right? You feel the tension? Feel the tension? Because it's a whole lot easier sometimes to just say, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. If you don't do, if you do those things, then you're out, right? Isn't it a lot easier? Or it's a lot easier to just say, hey, you know, y'all do whatever you want, just don't kill each other, right? <laughs> Anything goes. Woohoo. Here's what I've discovered is that grace, grace makes me humble because I understand that I can't do it on my own. It makes me humble. But truth is what transforms me. I have to embrace the truth. We have to manage the tension. See, there are a lot of people. There, there are, there's a group here this morning that uh, you want to drink from the fountain of grace every opportunity possible, right? You just want, you know, like, do whatever you want because... You know, man, grace, grace, God's grace, just lather it all over. Because I just do whatever I want and God will, you know, and we, we, it's like we abuse the grace. Then there are those who want to be very rigid. You need to do this, you need to do that. You have a tendency of seeing all the things that are wrong in people. There's a tension. If you don't feel it on a regular basis in your own relationship with the Lord, if you don't feel it on a regular basis within the church, something's wrong. I, I think it's something we should constantly feel. Not that we're making ourselves feel it, but it's just part of, of, of who we are as followers of Jesus. Jesus had an ability. He, he was able to navigate being full of grace and full of truth. He was holy. He came from the Father. He was born of a virgin. He was spotless, the Bible says. He was a spotless lamb. He was perfect. He was without sin. But he was full of grace also. Full of grace. That's why he was able to kneel down with that woman who most people would never even want to be seen with somebody like that or talk to him. But he was able to sit down and have dinner with tax collectors, which were the despised, like they were the worst of the worst for the Jewish people. And yet, yeah, this time of year, tax collectors are not, yeah. God bless them, yeah, help. But he was able to sit down and have dinner and face criticism from the religious people that, oh, look at him, he's a drunkard and he eats with the tax collectors, he's just like them. But he was holy. He was perfect. He was without sin. Those weren't necessarily, like, that wasn't his thing, right? Tax collecting was not his thing. What they did was not his thing. But he was able to sit with them. He was able to show them grace. It's a powerful thing. See, I, I believe what happens when we learn to navigate that, we're going to experience God's grace, obviously. But as we em embrace the truth, it transforms us. We allow the Holy Spirit to transform us with truth. Not just truth that we hear on a Sunday morning, right? But the truth of God's Word we, that we learn in small group. Or from a study that you're doing on your own, reading your devotions. As we embrace that truth, it transforms us. Don't listen. Here's the tendency. We don't want the tension. That's the tendency. But, but we want to we avoid the tendency. We don't like that feeling. And so we're either going to go grace or truth. And I believe we need, to, we need to camp right there in the middle. 
Sometimes we're not going to get it right, but let's try to keep it right there in the middle. We have a tendency with truth, though, to water it down. Well, let me tell you what the Bible really says here. We can't water it down. We can't ignore it. We can't suppress it. The Bible has a lot to say about a lot of things in our lives. There's a lot going on in our culture. Some craziness. I'm working on a series that's going to be super controversial. Not, I'm not looking for controversy, but, but when it comes to our sexuality, the Bible has a lot to say about it. And we can have a tendency to avoid the tension. Man, there's a lot of tension, right? But here's what I've learned. When I embrace the truth, it transforms me. It transforms me. I'm a better husband because I embraced the truth. I'm a better father because I embraced the truth. I'm a better pastor. I'm a better friend. I'm a better person, a better human, because I embraced the truth of God's word. And it's transformed me. The truth isn't always warm and fuzzy. It's not always comfortable. It hurts. It demands that you and I change. It demands that we let go of some things. It demands something. But when we know the truth, the truth will set us free. Right? And so there's that tension we've got to learn to live in. So our relationship with the Holy Spirit is key. And without the Holy Spirit, all we're doing is changing packaging. The word transformation is a word that's, the word it's used is, is a metamorphosis. It's where we get metamorphosis from. And it means this, it's a profound change in form from one stage to the next in the life of an organism. And so there's a transformation that God is bringing to pass in our lives. It's from the inside out. But our relationship with the Holy Spirit is key. I got too many notes. I'm trying to figure out what to leave out here this morning. I got a lot to say. This metamorphosis, it's exactly what happens to a caterpillar when it becomes a butterfly. And it's a, it's a perfect picture of how God transforms us and how he changes us into the image of Christ. He's working in us. He's doing something in us. It's okay to not be okay. But it's not okay to stay that way. If you've camped out in it's okay to not be okay, you missed it. You've avoided the, the tension. It's okay to not be okay, but it's not okay to stay that way. God has more for you. He's perfecting his image in us. You're being transformed. Amen? So I discovered I couldn't change, but I could stop giving into the flesh. I could stop giving into the flesh. Romans chapter 13, Paul writes to the church in Rome, and he says, Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. I love this passage. Make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. I get this image in my mind, because maybe it's because I'm not a cat person, but I get, I get this image in my mind of putting out food for the cats. How many of you know if you put out food for the stray cats, I know you're cat lovers, I'm not going to diss you. I know there are a lot of cat lovers in here. I don't even love dogs anymore. I'm done with animals. All right. I'm done. I'm done with animals. And I, and I really don't like snakes. No, I'm just kidding. 
I'm just, I'm, I'm just hating on everybody this morning. But here's what I've learned is if you put out food for the stray cats, they come back, don't they? And not only do they come back, they bring their friends. I was on vacation one time in, 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 in Honduras, in Roatan, and, and we were eating. And, uh, and there was a lady next to us. There were, I, don't, I think that island had every stray cat in the world. They were everywhere. And, uh, and so there's this woman. All these cats are like, where are they coming from? And they're rubbing on your leg while you're eating. Like, no, that, that ain't cool. Anyway, and so... There's this woman over there. I saw her out of the corner of my eye. She's feeding the cats shrimp tails. I was about to lose it on her. I was like, what is your problem? You're attracting every cat from town. And I mean, they were just like, wah. Listen, you gotta, you, if you make provision for the flesh, the flesh is going to dominate. Do you hear what I'm saying? The cats are going to show up. So... Paul says to, to the church in Rome, don't make any provision for the flesh. I learned something. I discovered that I couldn't change, but I could stop feeding the flesh. I could stop putting the food out for the flesh. Amen? I don't know what it is in your life where you got to quit feeding, but don't make a provision for the flesh, because if you do, the flesh will dominate. Flesh desires, second thing, flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other. It's like a tug of war that's going on. And maybe at times you feel like you're the flag in the tug of war and you just keep going back and forth and back and forth. The struggle is real. I'm, I'm, I don't know this to be fact, but I'm told, I've looked it up, but that if you help a butterfly that's being coming out of the cocoon, if you help it out of the cocoon, like say, hey, I'm going to help you out, bro, you know, cut the cocoon and, you know, come on, be free, let's speed this process up. I've heard that it can never fly. It can't survive because it's the struggle. It's the struggle of coming out of the cocoon that actually is instrumental in the metamorphosis, the transformation. So yeah, there's a struggle in our lives. There's a tension that we have to, to learn to navigate and wrestle with. The third thing is if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. If you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. See, the early church struggled with that. They had to deal with that issue because there were those who said, no, we need, we need to, it's all about the law. We need truth, truth, truth. And they forgot about the grace, the grace, the grace. And so there was this tension that was going on. And they didn't want the tension. They didn't want to navigate the tension. The Holy Spirit doesn't need your help. He needs your cooperation. I know that there, in the back of my mind, I keep hearing this, the, these words, but that maybe there's some people struggling with that because they think, no, 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 we're, we're, you're giving people an excuse. I'm not giving people an excuse to sin. If you're one that's saying, oh, that, all right, I can just stay right here and not grow, you're not hearing me. I'm saying there's a tension. I'm saying you need to navigate that tension and you need to embrace the truth. You need to experience, but you're going to need the grace of God. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're one that is all about truth. You're going to need the grace of God. Usually when we finally experience that, then we kind of tone it down a bit. And we're like, okay, I understand. There's some tension. I got to, you know, I got to navigate some things here. Because I'm always trying to force things on other people. The Holy Spirit doesn't need our help. He needs our cooperation. And the same tension that they had to deal with in the early church in Acts chapter 15 at the Jerusalem Council is the same tension that we deal with constantly. Listen, as a pastor, I'll just tell you, you know, I would, I would 
in some ways, I would love to be able to just say, hey, here's the rules. Let's all do it. Everybody do this, right? But I understand something that that doesn't bring about transformation. We need the Holy Spirit to transform us. For the early church to, to require these Gentiles to uh, obey the law, it was almost like if you ever went away to college and then came back to your parents' house. I don't know, anybody ever experienced that? Like you went off to college, you're gone for a couple of years, and, and then you come back because you have to live at mom and dad's house, and then mom and dad decides they're going to treat you like a toddler. It's kind of the same thing. It's like, We're missing it, right? We're missing it. Here's what I believe. If the Holy Spirit purifies my desires, He doesn't need to micromanage my actions. There's something powerful that happens when you are following the Holy Spirit. You're walking in the Spirit. You're keeping in step with the Holy Spirit. He's purifying the desires of your heart. He's transforming you from the inside out. He's perfecting His image, right? We're His image bearers. So Paul goes on after after those verses. He goes on and and. This is a very famous passage or passages of Scripture. It says, the acts of the flesh are obvious. If you're confused about what they are here, it's obvious. There's sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's the truth. It's the truth of Scripture. Those who live like that are not going to inherit eternal life. It's a very narrow, right? But Then he goes on to say, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, NIV says forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, against such things, there's no law. So it's managing that tension between grace and truth. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions. In other words, they're making no provision for the flesh. They did, they, they're not feeding the cats. The strays have got to go. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. It's about fruit. It's about the fruit of the Spirit showing up in our lives. It's about the evidence of God's presence. His presence that took residence inside of you and me that moment, that day, whenever it was that we bowed our knee and our heart to Him and said, come into my life. When we did that, immediately God started to do something. There's a transformation If you have a fruit tree at your house, I'll guarantee you don't go out in the wintertime and curse it saying, give me apples. What is your problem? We don't have orange trees very much here in South Carolina, but give me an orange. What's the deal? You know, we know that there's something happening. We know it's going to produce fruit, right? Now, if springtime comes and summer comes and there's no fruit, then there's a problem with the root, right? There's a problem with something deeper. God's producing fruit in our lives. If there is no fruit, there's a problem with the root. And you got to check and see with your own heart, man, is there anything really happening here? Is there any life? Can you imagine what it would be like if we, we started cooperating with the Holy Spirit Can you imagine what it would look like in our own lives? If we walked in the Spirit, if we kept in sync with the Holy Spirit, if we allowed the Holy Spirit to transform us, 
If we embrace the truth, but also fall into grace when we need to, right? We experience this relationship with God. I wish 2 Corinthians 5, 17, when it says everything is new, that everything means on the outside was, was new as well. I don't think you and I could handle that. I don't think we could handle it. God transforms us. He peels off layer after layer. Man, I was a youth pastor. I've shared this story before. I was, a, I was, a, I was in ministry, full-time ministry for about five years when I realized I'm eat up with insecurity. Eat up with it. And if I keep living this way, it's going to limit what God wants to do through me. And I had to let it go. I had to shed it. But the Holy Spirit was patient with me. He was at work in me. He was transforming me. And you know what? When he did it, it was done right. I grew up with a lot of lust, a lot of perversion because of pornography. And when I allowed the Holy Spirit to transform me, he transformed my desires. Powerful what happens when the Holy Spirit is at work in us. The fear, all the fears that we have of people and failure. The Holy Spirit transforms us. He's at work in you. He is at work in you. If you are in Christ, if you have submitted your heart to Him and you've said, Jesus, come into my life, forgive me, whatever words that you chose to say, the point is there's a submission. There's a, a coming under the authority, the lordship of Jesus. Surrendering your own identity. And you say, God, I can't do it on my own. I need you. If that's something that you've prayed in some form or fashion, then the Holy Spirit has come to live inside of you. Think, well, wait, wait. You know, I still mess up. I still struggle with this. I still fall into these things. And I... St Man, I, sometimes I just, you know, I, I seem to just go backwards. The Holy Spirit is living inside of you if you've surrendered to Him. I don't want to give you some kind of false hope. Just because you came to Vive Church and walked through these doors doesn't mean that you're automatically a Christian, right? Just like going to McDonald's is not going to make you a Big Mac. Don't try to do it. It's not going to happen. Chick-fil-A, well, you don't turn into a chicken sandwich either you know it, it's not coming through the doors but it's surrendering our hearts to Jesus you get it the Holy Spirit's living inside of you the more you embrace truth the more you're going to be transformed that's why I think it's important to be in the Word. It's important to be in small groups where the Word of God is being talked about and discussed and encouraged. It's important to be at church on Sunday morning. It's important to do your devotions, read your Bible. As you're in the Word, as you're in the truth, you're able to, you're able to embrace the truth, right? If you're not in the Word, if this is the only word you get, then the process is probably really slow for you. Because truth is kind of rare. But the more you embrace truth, the more you're transformed. Amen? Would you stand with me? So we're discovering how to be human. This new way of being human. What it looks like. And 
how the Holy Spirit works in our lives. Here's what I want to do this morning as we're closing this afternoon is let's apply it to our own lives. Let's apply this to our own lives. Maybe you're here this morning and you need to embrace truth. You've been drinking from the fountain of grace way too much. Just saying, ah, you know, God will forgive me. God will forgive me. You need to embrace truth and let it transform you. Maybe you're feeling guilt-ridden. And you're feeling like, man, I'm, I'm like a stepchild in God's family. I, I don't know if he even likes me today. Experience his grace. He does love you. He does love you. And he has a plan and a purpose for your life. Get up. Get up. Amen. Go and sin no more. That's the kind of church that we're going to be. We're going to be a church that manages the tension between grace and truth. Sometimes it's, sometimes it may look a little different, you know, and we may, we may struggle with it, but I telling you my heart is to manage that grace and truth and to allow the Holy Spirit to transform us so can we do that can we just surrender to him today can we open our hearts to him and ask him to lead us and transform us father we thank you God we thank you Lord that your Holy Spirit that work in us we thank you that you're transforming us that you're producing fruit in us that you're growing us for the person here this morning that maybe is afraid to embrace truth because they're afraid of what kind of change this that's going to happen in their life God would you just give them the courage to embrace that truth knowing God that you're wanting to transform them to change them to to set them free God have your way in us for the person who's ridden with guilt struggling to feel your presence God would you wrap your arms around them and let them sense your grace your mercy Thanks again for joining us today. We're hoping that this message brought you to life. 
If you have any prayer requests or if you'd like to connect with our church family, you can email us at info at vivechurch.com or you can fill out the contact card section in our app. We're looking forward to hearing about all the ways that God is moving in your life. And until next time, go bring somebody to life. <laughs>